before I introduce um, Kafi, I'd like to introduce uh, Evan Lewis, who is a visionary and strategic leader uh, who is committed to educational equality, social activism, and empowering marginalized groups. He has spent the past decade working at the forefront of national movements to eradicate the achievement gap by providing high quality educational opportunities to marginalized communities and reframes the national dialogue concerning the fates and futures of students of color, especially in higher education. Evan is the great grandson of Lent Shaw, who was lynched in Georgia in 1936. He has worked diligently over the past few years to build a formal community of scholars, legal experts, and activists committed to preserving the legacy of his great-grandfather and other lynching victims across the American South. Evan is the founding of executive director of the Legacy Coalition, a national nonprofit organization that seeks to secure reparative justice for American citizens whose ancestors were lynched and acts of racial terror during the Jim Crow era. Evan is also the Assistant Dean for Community Engagement at the School of Humanities and Fine Arts at the University of Massachusetts and Amherst. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you here, Assistant Dean Lewis, and I appreciate you being present with us this evening. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. And, and, and I should start by apologizing to you. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't intend for you to have to read the, the, the whole bio there. So I should have uh, followed instructions and sent you the, uh, the, 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 the shortened version, I apologize. Um, fantastic film, uh, really powerful film. Um, uh, I'm uh, glad to be here with you all and really um, kind of blown away um, by the privilege of sharing this space with you all, particularly you, Kafi, who I would now count among my personal heroes. There, there are a few folks uh, that, that, that claim that space in my life, and uh, you can now count yourself among them for what that's worth. Uh, I think here I am supposed to introduce uh, Dr. Ona uh, and uh, Ms. Dixon, and so I will do that. I'm imagining that many of you all already know them, but uh, it will, for good measure, we'll go ahead and do this. Um, Dr. Ona uh, is a doctor of, is a doctor of ministry student at Boston University School of Theology, and is the inaugural FOR Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellow. The fellowship uh, supports. The, show, the fellowship is supporting his work in understanding rights-based approaches to spiritual care provision, especially in safety net hospital systems that serve communities that are disproportionately burdened by disease, morbidity, and mortality. And uh, Kathy Dixon uh, is a Boston bus driver and urban farmer who seeks equity for low-income women of color. In 2017, Kathy founded Boston's first cooperative for women a worker-owned urban farm food co-op called the Common Good Co-op, which includes women of all races, classes, and cultures. Um, and as we have all just learned, uh, she is a uh, phenomenal woman uh, of incredible talents and is clearly a star. Um, we know that now, and I'm sure the rest of the world will, will, will know it soon uh, when everyone gets a chance to take a look uh, at the film we just witnessed. Um, so, with that, I am going to ask uh, Fernando and Kafi, do you all just want to jump into the discussion or is there another uh, course of action you want to take here? We would like to just invite all of you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to discuss the film and invite folks from the audience if they have questions to please put that in the chat. But I'll start with Sister Kafi, absolutely. And thank you, Assistant Dean Lewis. You have no need to apologize at all. We appreciate you for being here. We appreciate, um, you know, I, I encourage everyone here to read the articles um, that Assistant Dean Lewis has written and has been part of. They're very powerful and they're a powerful testimony to not only his genealogy, but many, many families that have been impacted, deeply impacted by the legacy of white supremacy, the, the, the symbolic and cultural violence of lynching in our country that is still alive and well today. And as you witnessed in the, in the screening of, of Reckoning in Boston, is something that 
people like Coffey, who powerfully leads the, the Boston Women's Cooperative, the Common Good Cooperative, has been seeking transformational work mm -hmm. to support uh, Black and Brown women in the city of, of Boston. So Sister Coffey, did you want to weigh in? Yes, I am no longer a bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Um, I remember one time about that story. I was um, working on this lot and uh, my minivan that the woman had just drove it out and I needed to get over and mow the lawn when I asked my father to pick me up. And he came pick me up and I was in my muck boots and my gloves and I had hose and I had the, the lawn mower and I was putting it in his trunk and he he drove me down the street and um, to the farm site and asked me what I was doing and didn't I have a job? <laughs> and I said, this is my job. I said, driving a bus pays the rent. So um, as an experience in my life to this work, uh, I've been an urban and rural farmer for about six to seven years now. And um, the site that you saw in the documentary, um, is a gift to the woman here in Boston, as I remind people, a small gift um, from an uh, African-American woman who farms and grows to a group of women in a community that deserve more. Um, but to segue into that, um, I also understand a lot of times it takes more than once to see this documentary to really settle in with some of the subject matters and to encourage um, in this space together, um, to live out the intention of the Common Good Project, which is to acknowledge that this is safe space for all. And the documentary is an opportunity for to start conversations. It's a tool. And uh, Fernando, Evan, and myself are here to better explain to communities what brings us to this work with the Fellowship of Recon Reconciliation, with the Common Good Project, um, in the school, uh, UMass Amherst, um, as a dean of a school of uh, humanities, um, what brings us to New England to talk about um, structural violence, systemic violence, and what that means for the health and well being of these communities, and to focus in specifically on the generational relationship that um, the gender-based relationship that Black women have with um, our country and this region and the state, but also the generational relationship uh, that Evan talks about so eloquently, uh, violence that African-Americans, maternal, paternal, have had within this country and have been um, the violence that they've been uh, oppressed upon and the spectrum of that violence as we go from conversations about lynching to conversations about municipal sanctioned violence um, regarding a simple uh, urban farm and conversations around sustainability. Coffee, as you know, I'm, I am this inaugural fellow for FOR um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's in honor of, of, of uh, Walter Wink and June Keener Wink and Walter Wink is often quoted saying that violent revolution fails because it's not revolutionary enough. Like mm. violent revolution fails because it's not revolutionary enough. It changes the rulers, but not the rules, the ends, but not the means. Mm -hmm. And what is remarkable about the, the calling that you've been, you're engaged in with black women in the city of Boston has been a nonviolent revolution, right? To actually transform the rules and attempt to really shift this symbolic order of violence. And I, I, I was, I, it has been such in witnessing you in this documentary, but also you're my, you're a sister to me, right? And I, you know, one of the things that in my witnessing of you and my encounter with you and my consistent. It, we, we've known each other for many years, but in the work that we do together, right? What I, what you've always said to me is, Fernando, we stand, right, nonviolently, mm -hmm. right, because that's more revolutionary than, right, right, the reactive, let's take up God, like violence, to try to change these things. 
every attempt you make at City Hall or every attempt you make in, in the work you do, right? Mm -hmm. Has been actually done quite remarkably with loving kindness and compassion, sister. And I just wanted you, I, I'm curious about, because there's such a tension, there's such a, a, a challenge, because there's a, for me, there's this, this wanting to be reactive in these spaces, right? Because I'm tired, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. And I'm, I'm curious to, and not to say you're not tired, angry, and frustrated, but when in my witnessing of you, there has been such a profound centering and peace in such profound chaos at the same time. Well, you know, I would I would question that. You know, I remember uh, having a conversation or reading an article. I think it was a conversation that had me follow up with the article. Um, I had left Boston when I was 19 and, and moved to Connecticut, I'm feeling that it, Boston was not the best place for me to raise my kids. Not mm -hmm. that I, I, I experienced violence here. I didn't know what violence was as a young mother with three kids at the age of, well, two kids at the age of 19 and by 21, three children. Mm -hmm. Um, I just feel I didn't feel that Boston necessarily was a place to be a mother, right? Where was the green space even back then mm -hmm. in 1990 when I had my first daughter, Patrice? Where was the green space as we lived on a third floor in Mattapan? Um, but I remember going to Boston, going to Hartford, going to Connecticut, Bloomfield, and working at the JCC and talking about the theory of, of how the Holocaust um impacted their their dna like how it was within their skin and their bodies and this was before there were many articles written on it and and feeling fascinated and wondering whether for black people thinking about what our holocaust was what 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 our with our historic um bathing and violence right um, how do we recognize that work? And I mean, again, it's apparent in um, Mr. Lewis's work, but I question whether that was sometimes, I question whether that was oppression. I question if I think about what black men and women, people like Fannie Lou Hamer, Angela Davis, the extent that they were willing to go the Sisters of the Columbia River Collective in Massachusetts, and there are some in our country, some, some people of color who, who say enough with the presencing, enough with the kindness, right? Um, and, and are really willing to hone in on the violence begets more violence. And, and that's how we get what we want. So this is where we're coming as a society. But a lot of, a lot of my, the, the, the understanding that brought me to that piece was how am I a better reflection for this work with Black women? And if I tell Black women, if I reinforce in Black women how we react to violence against our family and our children, right? The, the same violence that has us arrested, the same violence that has us evicted, the same violence that dehumanizes us. Am, am I giving the woman the tools mm. to better understand the deep, spiritual healing and physical and mental healing that goes along with having safe space, safe conversations, and the ability to be who we are as Black women, not BIPOC. I receive the, 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 the statement BIPOC, but as Black women, as a culture. Mm -hmm. So it was a testament. It was an agency for them, right? A frustration possibly an oppression of what does it mean to really be our authentic selves and our anger and sadness and depression, but it was also representative of what am, what am I teaching the woman as I bring them into the space? Mm. And how am I, the Christian Baptist woman that I'm around would say, oh, talk about generational curses, but how am I perpetuating mm. generational trauma? Mm -hmm. And, and how is generational trauma still existent in the Black body when it comes to how we embody certain spaces and certain conversations? And I also think that may be a, a question for Evan. Yeah, I, I, I would echo a lot of what I hear you saying. Um, and I, I guess I'll give a little bit in the way of background here, but I do want to follow up with this point uh, with a, a follow-up question for you, Kafi. Um, 
in looking at you and in looking at the film, I see reflections of not just a lot of um, people that I've known throughout my life, women that, I, that, that have uh, played formative roles in terms of shaping me into the man that I've become, um, but also uh, it, it, it really, in, in a really remarkable way, sort of harkens back to my great grandfather's lynching in ways that I didn't expect coming into the film. Um, you know, my great grandfather was a sharecropper. Um, and so there, there, there's the obvious sort of calling to the land um, that is tied to the work that you're doing there. And I'll get to my point uh, in, in, in really uh, quickly here. Take your time. I, I appreciate it. We, we invited you here for a reason. And so did the, the, the reparations assembly. So take your time, please. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, I came to my work in the reparation space at, largely as a result of my work uh, to uncover uh, the, you know, the facts and the truth and the history of my great grandfather's lynching. And when I initially came to that work, I thought that what I was doing was unpacking the story of my great grandfather. And shortly thereafter, I realized that what I was actually doing was unpacking the life and the legacy and the work of my great grandmother right, who often goes missing in these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but she was the one who, in the face of the lynching, in the face of the atrocity, um, had to find a way to pull herself together and to reconstruct the life in Chicago um, for her 11 children and herself, right? And I see a lot of that reflected in you uh, in terms of bouncing back from, um, from you know what I will sort of delicately call you know sort of personal tragedies here, mm -hmm. um, and finding the strength to rebuild not only for yourself but to occupy a space of leadership. And this is the thing that I really want to tease out with you because you responded to Fernando's question, um, really, with an answer that was about modeling the behavior that you that that you wanted to project to other women so that they could be their best selves. And I'm really curious about how you came to occupy uh, that, that leadership space internally, because it can often be very difficult for some folks, and you might be one of these folks, it, it, it comes naturally, but I'm very curious about how you were able to um, to occupy that space for yourself and others, even as you were dealing with your own personal tragedies and overcoming those? That, that is the first time I've had that question. Um, I've been the crazed woman. Um, when I talked about Anne Sexton, I came to Anne Sexton, Sexton, the poet, a bunch of different ways as, you know, although I was black and she was white with this despair. And another one of her poems was, um, I have been her kind. I have been the, the woman craze going down the cart, you know, a five finger thing. I, I've, I've experienced the, the retribution of what it is to go into space and, and demand what you know is right. And as a younger vulnerable woman, I bear the brunt of those repercussions. I, I foster care. I've been in foster care, DYS. Um, having you know, people decide not to um, supply me with the resources I need needed as a young black woman, as a, as a mother, and I learned to code switch and to get past for the safety for my the safety of myself, my children, and my children's fathers. I evolved in a violent space and came out on the other side. Or as Dr. Ona reminded me, what it is to center yourself in the storm. What it is to find that, that place of peace in the storm and to center yourself. And it was through those experiences growing up and to hone and to sharpen them with the understanding that people like Dr. Ona, people like Fernando, people other people in my lives, Nolan Walker, other men, other women, sharpened it with education, with um, showing me that this was not solely my experience. So when someone from the ivory towers, as Dr. Ona would, as Fernando would describe it, drops down the research like rain in a desert, 
to coffee, this is not just your experience or the experience of just a few women in your community. This is the experience of, of a large portion of Black women, research says, social determinants of health, incarceration rates, um, early death, uh, social services, generational lack of education. It doesn't make sense for me to throw kindling into that fire of women, but to provide them the techniques, therapy, green space, peace, presencing, centering, belonging, access to people like uh, Fernando and so many others. That, um, that the real power in the work that I was attempting to do for the woman was in being a reflection for what was possible because I came from the same space they came from. And I don't know if that is leadership as much as it's in, in, in a determination to be an ally and to be a reflection. I, I wouldn't say I'm a leader as much as I say that I'm a reflection for what is possible. And what I did with the city of Boston was show them that I am a reflection for everything you were asking for. So what is the problem? And if I can't get past this, this violent system of san municipal sanctioned violence, how do I ask any of the women who are biting their tongues, coming to this meeting, breathing through it, centering, walking with me and um, going with me to Vermont and Western Mass? If I can't get through this process and I have evolved into the reflection of what you think is a Black woman who lives in the community should be, then you have essentially created a false narrative of how somebody pulls themselves up by their bootstraps. And that's not leadership. That was acknowledgement and guidance and being an ally to the woman. Interesting, fascinating. I've got a couple of follow-up questions. I don't want to dominate the space. Uh, Dr. Una, is it, did you want to jump oh, in here? Please, please ask, you know, ask your questions, absolutely. Yeah. Great, great. So that is an incredible answer, uh, Kathy. Um, I would say, I would, I would tell you that from my perspective, that is both allyship and leadership, mm. right? And that oftentimes the most effective leaders um, are allies, um, you know, in 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 many ways. Um, but I, but I certainly take your point. I want to circle back to a couple of the scenes in the film and, and just tease out a couple of points that I thought were really interesting. Um, and then I think we're beginning to get some questions in the chat so we can circle to that um, shortly you know, th thereafter. There were a couple of scenes in the film where you're dealing with sort of these separate and in some ways dueling arms of like the architecture of city government, yeah. right? And so, um, and you were doing it with with with, with such skill that um, with with such skill that my guess is that you were able to lead folks to conclusions uh, that they didn't realize, you know, that that, that you were pushing them towards, um, and that you were also uh, in some ways um, highlighting, you know, a lot of the the the. the the discrepancies, right, in, in, in the information that you would get from one person, you know, in one conversation, and then, you know, the information you might get from someone else uh, in a in a different conversation. And I'm curious about one, how you were able to handle those situations so skillfully, and two, I'm curious about the second part, um, and sort of full disclosure here. I'm the assistant dean at UMass, but I'm not an academic. Right. Um, and so um, many of my personal experiences run parallel to what I've seen from you, Kafi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't hold a PhD. Um, I am someone who's been on the front lines, though, of doing mm -hmm. educational work for, for, for quite some time. And so I'm, what I'm really trying to, I'm clumsily getting to this question, and there's no really um, eloquent way for me to ask it. How do you handle it when you find yourself in these situations with folks who are in positions of power, but it becomes clear to, to you that you are the most intelligent person in the room? 
or at least the person in the room that has the most insight into the issues that they are supposed to be experts on. Um, I'm wondering one, if that's been your experience and two, how you navigate those spaces because it can be very tricky um, to, to, to navigate some of those power dynamics, particularly when you've got some aims that you're trying to extract. I apologize if that's an unfair question. No, that's a very fair question. I, I, my, my ego does not uh, allow me because aside from this work, I have a very vibrant side life. Mm -hmm. My ego doesn't allow me to get into, to judge or critique people. Where I catch people is what they say they want to do. And then I present a resolution. This documentary is a resolution. It's insight, but it is not used by the city of Boston yet. There was a reparation screening that happened in the city of Boston and I was not invited to participate. So how are we really doing that work if it's a Latin American, Latinx woman, an African diaspora, of course, and a white woman bringing reparations healing, but not inviting someone who has a whole entire documentary or the structural violence in the city upholding that violence to speak about what reparations could mean for a city, diverting to academics rather to the women on the ground who actually want to speak to generationally what it meant for their parents' homes to be taken in tax abatement for them never to have to not um, their, their mothers, their grandmothers, their, their mothers themselves, never to have known home ownership, but only known social services of section eight. So if you want an answer to the question, you present the answer and authenticity, authenticity or the inauthenticity of the person across from you is whether they grasp onto that answer. And when they don't, it's performative, it's it's it, it's fine. That's who you are. We all need to grow in that space. But you have just rendered yourself inauthentic. And also, I come to that to that the inauthenticity is not a judgment or the lack. Of the inauthenticity is is a, uh, is a powerful word. I'll even I'll 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 water it down a little bit because I don't think everybody is 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 that you know makes it to that point for me it says that if there is still we cannot we have been brought up in this system and fed on a system that says that whiteness will provide our liberation and then with an anger towards whiteness when it does not liberate us when we integrate and the integration is not filling it doesn't resolve and i almost say that we're, we're victims of white privilege, colonialism, and capitalism because, and at times, charitable work because we have lost the tools. We as Black women have lost the tools and Black men of how to be self-sufficient and sustained and also in mass be equals to our um, white brothers and sisters who are not all existing in privilege, but American society has deemed them better than or more privileged or more acceptable in certain spaces, even people of color who are white facing. So um, what I realize is there's compassion and Fernando really sharpened um, my focus on what it is to be compassionate about someone, not to be angered, not to hate them, not to be revengeful, but you know, what it was for Martin Luther King before he became angry, to be to see people and to to extol compassion on them. And those people who there are people who want to do better work and be better in relationship with African-American communities. And those people are people who benefit from, like Jane's, who benefit from these relationships with us. But um, it's either compassion or if the person fights me on it, like if I'm like bouncing around in front of them and they really fight me on it, then, you know, so be it. It's that's their path, and I'm I'm not here to carry the burden of educating people on how to be to humanize Black people better, 
and not just put up a sign of Black Lives Matters and say what a shame it is for that neck to that knee to be on that man's neck or the taser to come out. What a shame it is that those Black women are in homeless shelters and that they don't have housing. What a shame it is that their sons are reverting to drug dealing and killing in the street. Um, if, if you don't wanna know at some point, somebody else besides me, and usually it's young academic black and brown women are coming up within the ranks, real BIPOC women, our, our Latinx, our uh, AAPI, our African-American, and they are now holding people to task with the same education that I may have been deemed as uh, not worthy of. So I compassion a lot of times. And sister, I've witnessed consistently over and over again that, you know, it's amazing how, how I've been in spaces with you where you're completely dismissed, but then there's a, an, a, an equal force of extraction from you nice. because of, you know, this, this, this real, and, uh, you know, this is part of this architecture of mm -hmm. what I believe is white supremacy and what I believe is the scaffolding, this from the root of our country is the scaffolding of that power and privilege that dismisses you, but at the same time wants so much from you, right? Extracts from not only you, but the communities that you come from, you know, and that, you know, in, in, in this documentary just captured, like in a lot of ways captures what I've already witnessed like long time ago with you, right? Like this is something that is not new to me, but I encounter a lot of times where I'm like, with folks who are like, wow, Fernando, is this really happening? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, there's this both and that's going on that persists in this, in the, in, in that, that what I, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, sister, it's like, you know, what you are with other women emergently mm -hmm. creating, right? Has been something that's been going on for like centuries to in my head, right? This is nothing new. Yet it becomes new and, and becomes something that we want to extract because it's something like, wow, there's some deep that, you know what I mean? I, hey, it, but Fernando, that is essentially saying that we still, still are not deemed the people to do this work. Yeah. And that is the marginalization. And what comes <laughs> into my mind, the reason that I, I feel it's so important to have you here and um, Evan is the capturing is part of. American history, yeah. the capturing and the marginalization and the dehumanization is part of American history, but how do we come so far that we're still, and again, we're here to hold space about how do we come so far that we're still dealing with the dehumanization of women who were trying to give New England what they asked for. You said you wanted local food systems. Mm -hmm. We gave, I gave you urban farms, right? I gave you urban farms. You said you wanted better health for, and to, to be, do anti-hunger movements for black women and to, to teach them about composting and climate change and the environment. I built boxes, brought them soil and taught them about soil health and seed propagation and heat mitigation without air conditioners and, um, and better health with shoveling compost. Mm -hmm. you, you, you say you want more diverse and inclusive communities. You know, I, I brought community process to a space where somehow, some way we were locked out of a public meeting and that person has still not been accounted for of how you lock a community member out of a public meeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, the extraction is the capturing because now my words will be taken in mass by all these screenings and they will be quoted by people who are already in places of power and in, in comfort and the, as their innovation as their word as their understanding not knowing that they took that from a woman sitting on a panel across on the other yeah. side of the country the capturing of it all absolutely and that same capturing and that need to be extractive of Black communities it is what leads us to the conversations about what is reparations for Black men and women, maternal, paternal, generationally. What is reparations for the mother and father who tell their children, mm -hmm. don't put on that hoodie? Mm -hmm. 
or tell their children, I don't want you to go over at the white people's house because I don't know what's going to happen to you. What is reparations for those stories that are told now and those stories that have been told in the past and how we're bathed in it and we're indoctrinated in it to a point that is oppressive to our mental and our physical health? And are we ready to do the work to confront it? And only Evan would know, not only Evan would know, but I think Evan contributes to the conversation about what does generational violence look like for, um, for descendants of slaves. As much as I wanna bring into something, my last point is on, there's a, an entire movement within the United States with African-Americans, especially men of the quoting of themselves, calling them ADOS, African descendants of slaves. And that there's an entire ADOS movement that is not, that I'm not sure is integrated fully into the reparations movement and also is becoming a movement of conservative blacks. And I, I, I don't know. If Evan, if we can talk about that as well, but there is an anger building based on the marginalization of a community that I think people are turning a blind eye to as they capture and extract and not realizing that there's a larger wave coming behind women like me that may not be so compassionate and accepting of the lack of um, acknowledgement of uh, uh, humanization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ADOS. <laughs> You're yeah. doing a, uh, a masterful job of drawing me out. So I will take the bait here uh, yes. and, uh, and, and, and jump in a bit. Um, by the way of, of, of sort of personal biography, I, I think this, this is instructive. So I, I'll just sort of, um, yeah. you know, spit this out. So, um, you know, I, I'm a graduate of Cornell University. I was a philosophy major, so I was, you know, thrilled to see so much philosophy interwoven into the yeah. film. Uh, it, 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 it struck a deep chord in me, um, right? So I'm this black man with this Ivy League education, but I'm also, um, you know, from the South Side of Chicago. I was raised in the shadows of the University of Chicago, uh, in 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 one of the most sort of desperate uh, communities uh, in that city. Um, I'm the son of, uh, of former Black Panthers, uh, right? And so, in many ways, um, you know, I'm 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 what folks you know in that community call a Panther baby, uh, mm. and this is one of the reasons that your work uh, is so resonant for me. Uh, I grew up going to community schools. Um, I grew up um, engaging in spaces that were sort of holistic and affirming, um, and 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 truly community based. Um, in ways that I think are consistent with your vision for the work that, that, that you're doing, uh, Kafi. And so uh, I say all that to say that, um, that I'm intimately aware of the sort of tension that exists, yes. uh, you know, that you are sort of giving voice to here, Kafi. And I think that you're right. There is, there is certainly an undercurrent of, uh, of, uh, of, what I'll call anger uh, that probably doesn't quite capture it, um, right? That exists in, in, in many black communities around the nation. But I think that the point that you're getting at is really the most fascinating point, right? As it relates to the, to the ADOS the sort of faction of the movement that is in many ways being co-opted by a sort of conservative, um, more solidly middle-class black folks. One of the things that's really fascinating is how um, the anger is not emanating so much today from um, the truly sort of downtrodden and dispossessed, right? It's okay. coming from the entirety of, uh, of the Black community and coming from some folks that, that, that some spaces where you might not typically expect it. Um, and so I do think that um, not only in terms of sort of, you know, uh, from, from, from a place of morals and from a sense of justice, does it make sense to truly engage um, folks like you, Kafi, uh, who are um, who are uh, embarking upon this work in ways that are truly constructive, right? But also from a strategic point uh, standpoint, it makes sense for the country to embrace that because uh, the alternatives uh, may ultimately be uh, far more um, damaging than um than, than I think any of us you know want to see yeah you drew out a couple of other very interesting points right uh, around um what reparations look like but more important like what repair looks like right so I, I heard you speak to sort of the resources 
uh, and to finances and, and economics, but I also hear you speaking to this real sort of psychic pain and psychic terror um, that is inflicted upon so many folks uh, and the generational trauma that many of us carry. Um, you know, I am one of the very few folks in my generation of my family who grew up knowing the entirety of my family's story, knowing how we ended up in Chicago yes. uh, from Georgia, right? Understanding that uh, th that my great grandfather was falsely accused of rape, uh, and uh, and was uh, was lynched with an earshot of uh, his wife, uh, his and his daughters, and his sons. In the aftermath of that lynching, his sons were marched out to the body um, to see his castrated body, and told that there would be no more no more shawmen in Georgia, right? And so. Um, that is how my family ended up in Chicago. And I am the first in the family to go back to Georgia and to sort of, in some small way, begin to reclaim some presence there. Mm -hmm. And I think I feel a lot of resonance with, with what I hear you saying about your trip to Connecticut and then your return to Boston, right? Because um, sometimes we have to revisit the spaces where the horrors and the atrocities have occurred in order to truly heal. Um, and so I do, I don't want anyone to lose that in the broader conversation around reparations. And to be clear, in my, from my perspective, reparation, reparations must include uh, resources. It must include finances, right? There must be uh, some sort of a, a financial trend transaction that is tied to this movement, if for no other reason than because we understand that that's what the country truly, uh, truly values. And so anything less than that um, represents a less than fully sincere effort at repair, but there also must be a real painstaking effort taken to ensure that communities, Black communities that have suffered uh, this generational trauma are given the space to heal. And you know, if we might follow your example, uh, Kafi, not just provided a space to heal, but given agency and given the opportunity to take leadership in that healing, uh, because only we can, uh, only we truly understand the depths of the pain, and yeah. so only we can truly be at the center of that healing. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be quiet in one second, but I do want to revisit one of the many quotable lines that I pulled from you, uh, you know, in the film. I believe it, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I believe it went something like, if we're going to talk about the deaths of our sons and our daughters, about displacement from our communities, if we're going to talk about bias and gentrification, then we are going to have to do it on our own, right? Um, and I think that once we do it on our own, then we can bring other folks along that pathway, um, but it has to be a conversation that we start. And I wonder if you might be uh, willing to uh, to speak a little bit more to what you meant when you made that comment. Yeah. Um, the capturing is that it's not just my voice, but many voices of many Black people have been taken from them. And I remember the first experience as an adult woman of having my voice taken from me was an article in Yes Magazine that a, a BIPOC farmer wrote about me and then refused. She refused to name me in the article and her white editor refused me to name me in the article. And I had to contact the editor of the magazine and say she just recounted my whole entire life story that I shared with her and refuses to name me in the article. I'm named everybody else because I was too close in proximity to this platform that she was building in this region. Um, and that was a violence for her, but I, I also wanted her as my sister to understand in her biracial, um, in her, her biracial origin, there was something to be understood about what, what is the pain for maternal and paternal African Americans that there, 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 there is no beautification of colorization to be white facing and to be accepted in the community where the resources are. And that I'm not asking for any of the funding she's looking for, any of the acknowledgement that she's looking for. What I'm doing is trying to do that work on the ground. But to say to do it for ourselves is that with the 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 having 
having myself captured by that or my voice taken from me is there's a realization that a lot of people deem uh, ordain who is behind these conversations in this work. And how do you reconcile the, the violence within a community or repair the harm if you don't allow the people who are innovating on the ground to bubble up to the surface to say, this is how we've su survived. If you don't take the hush arbor of the, of the, the, the congregation in the wood with the quilt over the four sticks, as they were not just reading from biblical and religious and sacred texts, but they were also comforting themselves and talking about what liberation and freedom look like for them and how to exist in that space still as a community intact and living in with love. Those conversations were important and we as a whole can learn from the, those conversations. We can learn from the woman who has moved from canned corn to whole corn <laughs> mm -hmm. to growing her own corn to feeding her family and what were the iterations that went from canned corn to whole corn to growing your own corn to feeding your family better to growing tomatoes lettuce tending to your garden, laying in the grass with your children, walking through the fields with your family, with your husband, with your partner. But if you're just gonna say that, oh, black people need to grow corn. I mean, there's a, there's a the philosophy talks a lot about that, what is just and unjust. But if you're just gonna say, hey, these people, and also there's a famous term, you know, um, uh, if, if you you ask if you feed the hungry, you're considered a saint. If you ask why they're they're hungry, you're considered the worst thing in the world, right? I forget. Um, probably uh, you guys would know the exact quote. But there's something to be said about oh, the people need corn, but there's women on the ground growing the corn, and women on the ground growing the corn are like, what are you talking about? You don't even know why I'm out here. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what calls me to the space. So that's the thing about it is we're going to have to do it on our own. Our, our skin color, our classism, our gold ears and our, our, our bracelets, sometimes our, our hair extensions and our nails doesn't necessarily say that I am a farmer that built 42 raised beds and, and grow hundreds and hundreds of pounds of produce, shovel hundreds and hundreds of pounds of compost, have a class A, a class B, drive a tractor, was a grave digger, was a bus driver and still put on my blush and my dress and come present to be in community. And to say to women, you too can be this, right? But that's the, we have to do it on our own. That if I left it up to society against that, the other BIPOC farmer to say who was more of a farmer, I would not have been, been chose. I'm, I'm not deemed my persona, my body, my skin, my weight, my hips, my breast doesn't deem me as a, a farmer, but I no mistaken, I am that amongst other things and the intersectionality of black women, heterosexual black women at that, right? In the complex relationships we have within our communities, with our men, with our families. So are we supposed to let, to let people in our house to constantly explain how we plot our liberation? Or do we plot our liberation and move forward and whoever is with that liberation reconcile while that liberation is going on, while those reparations need to happen and how they're willing to support it. We move forward. And I've done this with little to no funding. And I've also housed pregnant women, transgender women, homeless nuns who were taken off the street of Harvard Square during the winter. But nobody knows about that because the liberation exists in this house, on this farm, in conversations of reconciliation, in these partnerships with FOR, in this conversation with, um, with Mr. Lewis, in um, under the guise of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, Assembly laid into Western Mass, which will become the new place for African Americans, not even new place, which will, become the space again where the black sociologists hypothesize about double consciousness and how we how we how we tend to our communities so it does have to be done on our own but we have to be provided the resources and we don't need the oversight as much as the celebration and acknowledgement 
that we are attempting to heal our community. I am with the help of you, Mr. Lewis, of you, Dr. Ona, of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, of Reparations Com Council to bring Black women as how we are into a space where just be patient with us, we're healing. Just be patient with us, we're growing. Just be patient with us, we're centering and existing. And according to philosophy, flourishing rather than just living. And so I've got one, I think, final question for you um, before we move on to, to the, and I'm not quite sure what the what, what, what the timetable is for the event. We might have like five minutes. I think we've had okay. everybody on for an hour and okay. I want to apologize. This is a very spirited place. And I also want to talk about the reconciliation work that Fernando is doing as well. You let's, know what, let's, yes. let, let's, let's transition directly into that space then. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and um, I actually just wanted, if there's a, a, a question in the chat as well as a, a longer comment um, uh, from the FOR community from, from Ethan, um, and I, would, I want to invite them into the room as well. But Bill asks, Coffee and Evan, um, has Boston become any more cooperative in terms of assisting in developing more urban farms like yours, Coffee? No. I, I figure if you haven't helped this project as much as we do, then you're not really doing any work or whatever your work you're doing, you'd have to kind of justify why you are doing that work and why this project seems to be still so anemic when it comes to municipal resources. And the reason that we hold this conversation in Amherst and not in Boston is because Boston's still not ready for this conversation. They show in every single move that they're not ready for this conversation. They do show that they're ready for change with uh, the, the new election. Congratulations to our new esteemed mayor, Michelle Wu. But they still show that they are indoctrinated, not in a racism, but in a classism and capitalism that still, that, that still is a dangerous space for people, right? For, um, for vulnerable communities. Um, but coffee, don't you also believe that it's also racism because like the black population in Boston is the fastest declining population in the city. Do I mean it's, it, it is capitalism, right? It is like, it, it is all these things that you're mentioning, but I also, I, ha, I, I, this is where I'm like, where, where you and I respectfully may disagree, but I'm like, I still think it's, there's, there's racism. We have a history of that deep sea that that's so baked into the structure of the city, right? Well, I, the racism part is a spoken unspoken, yeah. but sometimes it's very easy to talk about racism and the harder thing is to talk about classism. Absolutely. So it is racism, but a lot of times it's a classism that upholds that racism. I was listening to a quote by Maya Angelou who talked about um, the bourgeois. And if you wanted to leave a movement, you had to go find a thug because the bourgeois wouldn't help you because they have something to lose. A thug has nothing to lose and he'll help you fully. <laughs> Not to say that we all should go have thugs, but to say that and even then she was speaking about what it is classism and they asked her, but, 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 but aren't you middle-class? And she was like, I have money. That doesn't mean I'm part of the bourgeois. Like, what am I doing with my money and my resources? So um, what are we doing with our money and our resources? Mm -hmm. that delivers us from classism, genderism, and racism. It's easy for a person who's classist, as Harvard, just a few years ago, said to a woman who was on a murder charge, graduated and was offered, um, um, was offered a scholarship to Harvard. It was classism that that one person voting whether she should attend or not said that no, that because of her, even though she had served her time, because she was an ex-convict, that she, no matter how many people who have who they brought through their college, who have annihilated entire countries of people in Sierra Leone. This one woman who served her time was not deemed worthy to walk across the Harvard grounds. That's classism. That's not just racism. Well, some would say it's racism. I say it's racism and it's classism. 
Well, it's all of it, right, sister? It's all, it's all of it. And we have to have these conversations about what we do with our resources to tend to it. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's... Um, you know, even in being in the Amherst space, I want to hold you guys together as communities who are working on housing issues speak to the classism that might be on the rise in Amherst mm -hmm. and how AAPI communities are having their programs closed and are moving, having to go to Holyoke and other spaces to mm -hmm. do English as a second language as, as new citizens. And how now you're there's, there's potentially there are arguments over a huge library versus over bringing back in making affordable housing for families. Mm -hmm. That 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 can be racism, but the, the highly intelligent academic people. Do we want to say that you are still swimming around mm -hmm. in the pool of racism? Is it about being uh, about them being a different culture, or is it just them a book being more important than a child in housing? Mm. So we we have to talk about that, right? Absolutely. The violence to the AAPI community is just as violent as what's going on here in the city of Boston as we're creating these nomadic people who are just search, searching for resources, but. If we look at what Amherst means and what Western Mass had meant to Black communities in Great Barrington and what it will mean in the future, we have to we have to reconcile how we see ourselves and how we see ourselves in communities that aren't um, the who aren't necessarily ours, who are other than the community we are. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I and I'll just say this, Coffee, is that I I've, I've deeply appreciated how the You've lifted up the work, for instance, of Kimberly Crunch on the intersectionality and and understanding how we need to understand these intersections and and recognize that it's not just one thing but many things that come together. Yeah, it's In not just one... asking if they were supporting the work of urban farms. Are they supporting yeah. the work of owning land in a city? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Urban farms, there are 50 million land trusts down here, nonprofits who have thrown their hat into the ring, but they don't own anything. Exactly. Exactly. And the, 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 the violence in what I was asking was for ownership. It's not that I, I rolled out of bed and said, yeah. hey, I'm going to be a cooperative developer. <laughs> no, I said, you guys love cooperatives. Let's put this into a cooperative so that you don't think I'm a Black woman trying to steal anything from you. Exactly. That's the code exactly. switching and the, the evolution of it. Precisely, absolutely. And it's, I still wasn't worthy. That it was, still wasn't a worthy project yeah. to say that you guys should be able as a community to purchase this land. Yeah. And that's a deeper conversation. That is a deeper conversation. So, um, and I know we are coming, we have been I together agree. for about an hour. I invite everyone to sort of read what Ethan has written in the chat. Ethan, I, I'm going to invite you, and in if you wanted to share a little bit about what you wrote, um, um, feel free to do that. Um, it's very kind of you, Dr. Ona. Thank you, Fernando. And thank you so much, um, Kafi and Evan Lewis, for these really um, powerful reflections on this extraordinary film. Uh, I was really grateful to watch it in community with you all this evening and I've, uh, I've, I have a lot. Um, but as I wrote in the chat, I think one thing that was really evocative for me was in um, both reflecting on your, um, your own story of um, being unhoused and homelessness and the, and then um, in this particular moment, as, as I said, like this very day, um, this morning I was sharing space in a virtual context like this with a community of people from here in the Asheville, North Carolina uh, region uh, in a group called Faith for Justice Asheville, which is a, a community of faith and, and lay people um, led by a black woman pastor who organizes around issues of white supremacy in this land and on this part of the earth. And um, in our conversation today, we were really grappling particularly with some of the issues related to the extraordinary gentrification and displacement of Black communities that has been ongoing and persistent over many decades and, prof and profound. Um, but uh, at the, 
right now, um, there are some specific efforts that are happening to, once again, push out, remove, and so forth communities of people of all racial backgrounds. But of course, the impact on um, Black and Brown peoples uh, and Indigenous in this place of this Cherokee land are quite significant. Mm -hmm. And just shortly after that, uh, I was um, struck by catching note of a, a live Facebook broadcast that was happening by another faith leader showing uh, these encampments of people who are unhoused, uh, who have been trying to claim land in a way uh, in, in this place where there is nothing to really be, be had and being their, their tents and all their possessions uh, forcibly removed. So um, it, it is not to say it is in, in any way the same story as what you have offered to us, but uh, to have that uh, uh, it, that emotion and the, the the challenges that have been put before us as people living in this place to push back against our city and county leaders on this, um, uh, and I think um, I mean I, I could go on really at length because we've heard some other really significant things over the last three weeks uh, in this time of you know sort of holy days and holidays and so forth about how um, black people in this place are being their 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 land their homes their all that is being extracted and stolen from them in this moment not only from 1965 to 1975 and so forth but is being taken in through um user, usurious and, and and profoundly destructive ways so um so i think it just it provoked me both in terms of your story and then also um, I think maybe this is reflective of what um, Dean Lewis was, was sharing, some of the, um, the words that you shared that were yet still so visionary and, uh, and hopeful and encouraging in the midst of such despair. Maybe, maybe it reflects um, what Carl Chandler was saying in that Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka poem of the intricacy of love and suffering being bound together. Uh, and so maybe I'll just leave it at that, but uh, it was really poignant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to just hold into space um, the unhoused and our domestic migrants. Um, we think it's an issue of housing but it really is an issue of violence amongst the many forms of violence that communities experience. And one of the scenes that was cut out the documentary um, was of me sitting there on the grass and breaking down saying, I miss the scent of my bed. Mm. That I miss the scent of my bed that smelled like lavender and sage and that was under a window where the sun would wake me up and at night I would look up to the stars in the sky on Ashmont Street and how that was the traumatic thing that caused me to be angry that we are being so destructive and dehumanizing people and there are policies that can be put in place like reparations and reconciliations there are conversations that could be happened had by identifying the people who are who are behind these violent acts and 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 holding space with them I'm not saying we have to call anybody out or accuse anybody or judge them but we do have to to to, to bring make them present to what it is they're exactly doing and, and whatever justification that they feel the need to do it. And just like Evan's grandfather, there was a justification for that lynching and that castration. Was it justified? No. Is there generational trauma from it, from his sons and Ethan's family members? I mean, Evan's family members, I'm sure that they're, they're, Evan has wrote that there is. And how do you tend to it? Dr. Ona, Fernando would ask how we tend to it. Yeah, I think that's incredibly powerful. And I think that one of the things you're doing there is linking past injustices, right, to current injustices. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, one of the many 
um, Baldwin quotes that we uh, hold up uh, in this day and age, right? And 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 this is from um, from a letter that he wrote to Angela Davis while she was uh, incarcerated, right? And it's it's something to the effect of, if they come for us in the morning, they'll be coming for you at night, right? And and one of the things that we should always hold up is that uh, in the American context. Um, I was gonna say black folks have always been, but before there was the black folks that were the canaries in the coal mine, there were the native people that were the canaries in the coal mine, right? But in, 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 in the more recent history, um, you know, black folks have been the canaries in the, co in, in, in the coal mine here in, in, in America. And um, to your point, Kathy, um, one of the reasons why we have to learn the lesson from the past and why we have to all be uh, committed to uh, repair and redress uh, is so that these same atrocities don't continue to visit Black folks and don't continue to visit other folks um, because the power run amok has gone unchecked. So I, I, I appreciate you for holding that space, um, you know, for us and for our allies and for all uh, that are uh, falling victim to uh, oppression uh, in this day and in the days that have preceded. And as Walter Wink would say, uh, you know, the powers are fallen, but the powers can be redeemed. Um, and this is our work together. And so I, and I, I, I want to hold us in this space as we close this evening um, to thank Coffee, thank you for this. And Evan, also thank you for this. Um, your presence reminds us deeply about where we need to continue to be with um, in this deep light. So we appreciate everyone here in this room who's, who's stayed with us for this time. Um, we, Kafi, did you wanna say something before we formally end? Oh yeah, can you guys become members of the co-op? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you just go on iFund Women? We're just trying to raise our numbers. We do have the iFund Women platform is more of a solidarity platform. We do have our, our roles of women who are in the co-op, but um, this is a public platform to show, you know, where the support is coming from, as well as um, feel free to reach out to Fernando or Evan. There are people that are doing this work, and I'm sure would be willing to to uh, hold space and talks and with articles and literature to provide a, a gentle, loving perspective of why we should all wrap our hand around what it is to reconcile around violence and to do work around supporting nonviolent strategies before we let the people who are ushering in this wave of violence into our country before they take over. And, and that is, as I'm sure you know, in North Carolina and many spaces, that is what's, that is another thing that is the spoken unspoken that we are moving towards a more violent society. And it's, we have to bring the, the peacemakers, the space makers, the, the historians forward as a reminder of why we want to push back against these isms that is bringing forth the, the uh, uh, a social behavior that is um, past problematic but detrimental to uh, all of us. So um, yeah, we're on iFund Women or you can join through the co-op. We're just trying to get through this. And um, it's a way to keep in touch with us when we release our impact statement and um, our strategic plan uh, for the next generation of women that will come in after me to spearhead this work. Very special organization to uh, my heart and I couldn't see um, any happening any differently. And these are thought leaders. So I thank you, uh, Fernando, Bill, Evans, and I'm hoping that um, we can meet again soon in this work. Yes, and please be on the lookout um, for future um, screenings uh, as 
we go forward with this. So feel free to reach out to any of us at any time. Um, we thank FOR. We also thank the assembly for being here. Uh, Evan, thank you for your deep presence with us today and coffee as well. Thank you as well. We appreciate everyone being for sticking with us for this long. Yes. I know it's really late. So blessings to each and every one of you. And blessings thank you and for being problems. with us. Okay, good night and with peace. Mm -hmm.